in a dry and weary land where is no water my soul is thirsting for you i have seen you in the sanctuary beheld your power and glory my lips will glorify you i will praise you as long as i live in your name i will lift up my hands your love is better than life your love is better than life earnestly i seek you my soul is thirsting for you cause your love is better than life because you are my help I will be singing in the shadows of your wings. I'm staying close beside you. Your right hands upholds me. I think of you through the night. With singing lips I will praise and my soul will be satisfied your love is better than life your love is better than life earnestly i seek you my soul is thirsting for you Cause your love is better than life Oh God, you are my God Earnestly I seek you I'm longing for you Oh God, you are my God Earnestly I seek you, I'm longing for your love is better than life, your love is better than life, earnestly I seek you, my soul is thirsting for you. Cause your love is better than life Your love is better than life Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the PICC and the revelation of hope. I'm delighted to see every one of you here tonight. In fact, I think that many of you have been here for a number of nights and have been learning more and more of God's Word, and I am proud of you. You are in the right place at the right time. Wasn't that a beautiful piece that we heard from that male quartet? Your love is better than life. But I have even greater news for you. God's love means life. You don't have to give up life for God's love because in reality, He is our life. I'm delighted to see so many of you who are watching on Hope Channel Philippines throughout this region and beyond, including the entire world. Welcome, viewers, wherever you may be. Tonight, we're going to be studying something absolutely fascinating. It is the child born in the Middle East 
who will change the world. Now come with me back in time, 2,000 years to go, to an ancient island named Patmos in the Aegean Sea. It was on this particular island that an event occurred that focuses our attention on this revelation of hope. It was on this island that John the disciple, John the beloved, received the vision regarding the book of Revelation. John was the last of the disciples to live the one who lived to be the oldest, and he was exiled on the island of Patmos. Christianity was not welcome in the Roman world, particularly after Rome burned in the first century. Christians were blamed for this terrible conflagration, and in reality, Christians had nothing to do with it. Christianity was considered simply a derivative, some kind of result from Judaism. And since the Jews revolted against the empire, the emperor also had something against Christians and persecuted them, considering them to be Jewish fanatics. So John was taken, bound in chains, to the island of Patmos, that rocky island in the Aegean Sea. And there, John, still faithful to his precious Lord and Savior, committed himself to the God Almighty. You see, John was there when Jesus unleashed the view of those who were blind. He was there where Christ unstopped the deafness in the ears of those who were afflicted with that difficult situation. He was there when the Lord restored people back to full life. He was there when the lame were able to walk. He was there when Jesus fed 5,000 and more on the hillside just before Galilee. You see, John witnessed it all. He was there when the dead were raised to life, and he believed that Christ was the divine Son of God. John was not willing to face death merely because of his loyalty to a cause. He was not willing to face death just because of his loyalty to men. He was willing to face death because he was convinced that Jesus was divine. What was it that gave John such a death-defying faith on that island of Patmos? You see, he was willing to be beheaded. He was willing to have a sword plunged through his heart. He was willing to die in a boiling cauldron of oil. Why? Because he believed something very special about Christ. Revelation chapter 1 verse 9 tells us of John's vision of Christ on that island. It says here, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation of kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John, why didn't you just give up on all of this activity? Why didn't you turn your back on Christianity? If Christianity is just another philosophy, if it's just another ism, Marxism, Darwinism, Confucianism, whatever it happens to be, why didn't you just turn your back on that, John, and forget it? Why be exiled from your precious family and from your friends? Why be exiled from those who are the dearest and closest to you? Because John had a profound bedrock belief. Jesus said to John in verse 11, I am the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, I'm the beginning and the end. 
You see, that's the Greek alphabet, alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, the eternal one. Revelation chapter 1 reveals Christ's message to John in exile. Christ's message to John when he was facing death. Listen to what Christ said. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Verse 18, I am, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. You see, John, you're facing death. You're facing disaster, and you're facing the grave. But now I understand what you're facing, because I am he who lives. I was dead, John, but now I'm alive forevermore. So Jesus gives John this enormous hope for the future. I have the keys of Hades and of death. So he's telling John, I have the keys of hell and of death. And if you die, what consequence is, is, is that? Because I've got the keys that will unlock the grave and bring you eternal life. So you see, the key element in Christianity is its vibrancy that brings to the life a certainty that Jesus can accomplish something special in your life and provide eternal life. If Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he is more than human, he is divine. If Christ was resurrected from the dead, he has the power over the grave. You see, a Christ who is not dead, but a Christ whose tomb is empty, is a Christ who is alive. And ladies and gentlemen, here in the PICC, I want to tell you that Jesus was raised from the dead, and because of that, he is more than human, he is divine. If indeed, Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, he has power over the grave. So it is of little consequence whether John dies or not. If it's God's will for him to die, certainly he can raise him back to life. And John knew that. You see, if Jesus is really divine, if the grave could not hold him, then his offer of eternal life was absolutely real. If Jesus is, di is divine, if Jesus went into the grave and came out, Christ is the resurrected divine Son of God. So, if I die, I too can have this hope that Jesus can release me from the grave as well when he returns. So the grave is no longer a dark hole in the ground. It is no longer a long night without a morning sunrise. You and I can be resurrected also because Jesus is divine. So you see it all hinges on whether or not the tomb is empty. It hinges on whether the Christ that John believed in on that island of Patmos was indeed divine. This is what the whole issue of Christianity hangs on. Is Jesus really divine or just a nice person? He can break the bonds of the tomb if he is divine. He can change our lives forever. We don't serve some dead leader, some moral, ethical philosopher who rests in a mummified case or grave like Lenin. The tomb of Christ is empty. And if that tomb is empty, Jesus has power over the grave. And if that tomb is empty, he is alive and he can take charge of our lives and give us the promise of eternal life. Resurrection power can transform us. So here's John, exiled on the island of Patmos, 
isolated and alone, but really not alone at, at all. Christ is filling his life with incredible spiritual warmth. And that living Christ surrounded him with the love that would never let him go. The living Christ assured him in his heart and in his mind that he could have victory over the grave. Jesus being divine makes all the difference. So John was willing to die rather than to give up this incredible belief in a divine Christ. And this is what just lifted him up and also God's people down through the ages. This is what gave them hope for the future. The hope of the resurrection gave them such courage and spiritual power. Down through the centuries, Christians have been persecuted and tortured. They were willing to face chains and dungeons because they believed that their physical bodies might be destroyed, but nobody could destroy their relationship with Jesus Christ. They believed that one day they would soar beyond that dungeon, beyond that prison cell that kept them captive because the power of the chains would not match the power of the resurrected Christ. You cannot chain faith. You cannot chain a man or a woman's spirit. You cannot change that buoyant courage that soars above when you have faith in Jesus Christ. That's why people in the Colosseums were willing to face the lions and death. That's why they wouldn't burn incense to the Roman Empire emperor. That's why they wouldn't bow down to the gods of Rome. They would rather die than to worship Caesar. They believed that even if their bodies were destroyed, they would one day live because of the divine power of Christ. And they would live throughout eternity. And that's what's kept men and women's faith alive down through the centuries. In the communist oppression, <clears throat> there were people who were taken out of their homes, dragged to prison, simply for studying the holy word of God. They lost their lives. They lost their families. Husbands lost their wives. Wives lost their husbands. After the fall of communism in the Soviet Union in 1989, Stories of faith began to surface about some of the bitterest persecution and it came to light the true stories of how people faced it. Men and women who were in prison for their faith. They were in prison for nothing more than believing in Jesus Christ. and They had their hands and their wrists bound. Men and women who lost sons, who lost daughters. Men and women who had their homes broken into at midnight and had their children taken from their hands, ripped and burned in the streets in terms of their Bibles, but men and women who held fast to the faithful word of God. Why? Because they believed that Jesus is resurrected from the dead and that he is divine. They believed that Jesus was alive and you cannot destroy faith in him. They believed that one day Jesus would raise them from the dead and give them eternal life. Let's take a journey through the Old Testament and discover the Christ that John so fervently believed in. You see, all the books of the Bible meet and end in Revelation. Now let's discover some amazing things about Jesus. When you know who he is, when you really know in your heart that he is the divine son of God, deep down in your heart, you will understand that nothing can keep you chained to any temptation, to any difficulty, to any tomb, because Jesus is 
alive. Jesus will free you from the difficulties that you face each day. He will free you from alcohol, from drugs, from immorality, from materialism. He will free you from the infatuation of money and getting ahead at any cost which will bring compromise and destruction into your life. The Lord will take a complacent, lethargic person and infuse him with Holy Spirit power and transform that person. That is what Christianity can do. Sometimes people just like to read their Bibles once in a while, pray once in a while, but I want to tell you, when Jesus takes hold of your heart, when he truly takes control of your life, something happens. You become a new person in Jesus Christ. Your life is changed forever. You see, Christ comes down into your life and he changes that heart and transforms you. Come on a journey now to understand who is this Christ who can make such a difference in your life. In the very first verse of chapter 1, it says this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So who is the Christ of revelation? Is he really who he says he is? He says, I have power over the grave. I am divine. So the very first thing about Jesus is this. He claims that he was more than human. John 6, 38 indicates, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So this Jesus said he came down from heaven. He was not merely a human being, born in the same way as every other child, but he was born supernaturally. The Holy Spirit worked a miracle in the womb of Mary. All through Scripture, the Bible points forward to a Christ who is divine, a Christ that we can trust and have complete confidence in because he is the eternal Christ. He has been with the Father through eternity and will be with the Father and the Holy Spirit throughout eternity. He is divine. So why is it that John believed that Jesus was divine? Let's look at John 5, 30, 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these, the scriptures, are they which testify of me. That's what Jesus said. So when Jesus was right here on this earth, he opened the Old Testament scriptures and he began to explain and quote from those prophecies, some of them written 500 years in advance. Some of them were written 700 years in advance. Some of them even 1,000 years in advance. A particular eminent expert, Dr. James Strange of the University of South Florida in the United States, was fascinated with the specific prophecies of Christ's birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. And this professor developed a complex mathematical formula to discover the statistical probability of all these incredible prophecies in the Old Testament being fulfilled in the life of one man. His conclusion, this eminent professor, this, this very profound individual, indicated that the chances were one in one trillion to the sixteenth power that these prophecies could end up being fulfilled in the life of one man. So that's a one with a 144 
zeros after it. You see, prophecies point out that Jesus was the Messiah. Prophecies point out that Jesus was divine. In fact, Christ's life is a life written beforehand. The biography of Jesus was written before he was born. So let your faith grasp this incredible reality tonight. Let your spirit soar tonight. Christ was more than just a good man, more than just an ethical philosopher, more than a moral teacher, more than a religious leader. Christ was the divine Son of God. In the biography we're studying tonight, we will note that the place of Jesus' birth was predicted in advance. We will notice the manner of Jesus' birth was predicted in advance. We will notice that Christ's betrayal by Judas in the precise manner was predicted 1,000 years in advance. We will notice that David in the Psalms predicted the manner of Christ's death and described just how Jesus would die. God is going to touch your heart tonight as you understand the incredible predictions that pointed to the one person who can take you and me into eternity because he is divine. As you open your heart tonight to Jesus, he will come into your life in a powerful way. Somebody here tonight is going to leave a changed person. Somebody is going to leave here a new man and a new woman in Jesus Christ. Tonight, as we study about Jesus, open your heart because tonight may be the time Jesus does something extraordinarily special for you. It could be a miracle that will change your life totally. You see, the birthplace of Christ was predicted 700 years before Christ in the book of Micah. Chapter 5, verse 2. Bethlehem, out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Now, it was Nazareth where Jesus was brought up. Nazareth is about 90 miles from Bethlehem. You can make the journey today in a few hours, but if you're riding a little donkey, it would take you at least five days on a windy, narrow road. Now, what if you were in Nazareth six months before the birth of Jesus and you ask, where is the baby going to be born? Everybody would say, well, of course, in Nazareth. Nobody thinks it's going to be born in Bethlehem. What about three months before or one month before? Everyone's going to say the baby's going to be born in Nazareth. Is anybody going to think that a woman nine months pregnant is going to get on a donkey and take a ride for five days to Bethlehem? No way. But 700 years before, the Bible predicted that Christ would be born in Bethlehem, and indeed he was. Mary arrived in Bethlehem along with Joseph exactly on the night that Jesus was to be born. Prophecy, biblical prophecy does not guess Prophecy knows because it is given by the divine author in heaven. And the Christ that was born there in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, gives us an understanding of how accurate Bible prophecy is even to the intimate details of his birth. 
Isaiah 7, verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so a virgin conceives and bears a son. Emmanuel means God with us. You see, the virgin birth was not an accident. The virgin birth was a divine plan of God where the Holy Spirit conceived in the womb of Mary the Christ child, Christ who has always existed, Christ who always will exist, but he took a special period of time to come and be with us, to live a perfect life, to die as a perfect person, to rise again as a divine Christ so that he could give you and me eternal life. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was born of a virgin exactly as the prophecy indicated, exactly as Scripture foretold it. Now, you remember the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, and as the angel Gabriel appeared to her, he explained to her in her anxiety and her fear and in her nervousness what was being conceived in her womb, and that it was Christ. You see, Jesus is more than a good man. Luke chapter 1, verses 30 and 31, the angel announces the birth. The angel said to her, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Jesus more than a good man, ethical philosopher, or religious leader, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the divine Son of God. So John based his faith squarely on Scripture, not on some feeling of elusive understanding. It was not based on some electrical impulse that went up his spine and made him feel good. No, John's faith was based upon something solid, the Word of God. Now let me just again tell you, if one of you, two of you, ten of you, do not have a Bible for yourself, be sure to see someone at the registration table, one of our visitors here. If you don't have a Bible, get a Bible. For it is that same Bible that John placed his incredible trust in. The Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures. So don't just believe something because you kind of feel good about it. No, base your understanding of who Christ is and what He can do for you by reading it in the Word of God. Now if you're willing, to die because of bedrock faith like John had when Jesus says, I give my whole life for you. Even in death, I believe that he has the keys to the grave, as John said. You see, Jesus' birth was not just natural. It was supernatural. When shepherds gathered on the hillside in Galilee, they looked up into the sky and they heard the angels singing that incredible song, Glory to God in the highest. The baby Christ child was born in a Bethlehem manger. The highest authority in the universe came to the humblest place, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary, Jesus was and is the Son of God, the divine Son of God. Back in the days of the Exodus, Moses wrote in the book of Numbers, 1,500 years before Christ, in the 24th chapter, verse 17, a star shall come out of Jacob. You see, Moses described a star that would rise in the east and lead the wise men to the home of the Messiah. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was born of a virgin. The wise men were guided to the Messiah's home by a star 
prophecies fulfilled one right after another. You see, this wonderful Christ brought joy and happiness and smiles and healing to thousands of people as he gave them Bible truth. Where there was death, he brought life. Where there was sickness, he brought health. Where there was sin, he brought forgiveness. Where men and women were chained to habits, he set them free. Listen to how Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, prophesied of Jesus Christ. The Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And certainly Jesus did exactly that. You see, Christ can put the pieces back together in your life. It goes on to say to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. There is no one who is captive to anything that Jesus cannot release. You are in the power of Christ and all of heaven is available to you if you place yourself in his hands. No tomb, no prison, no chains can bind you if the Lord is truly helping to set you free. People who are bound to tobacco, people who are bound to alcohol, people who are bound to immoral habits, Jesus can set you free and open the prison doors. You see, the text goes on to say, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Jesus brings encouragement to those who are saddened, to those who mourn the loss of loved ones. That is the Christ, the divine Jesus. He takes the young child who was dead and he raises him to life. That is the Christ. He healed. He healed some of the worst diseases. He is more than a good teacher. He is more than a philosopher. He is truly divine. He has demonstrated his divinity. How can we know for sure that Christ will heal all humanity when he comes again? His power to heal some people when he was here in the first century is the greatest evidence of his power to heal all his faithful followers when he returns. As Jesus would move through a crowd, he would heal those who were blind. He would heal those who could not hear. He would heal those who were lame. He took away the difficulties and the physical problems. Most of all, he forgave. He forgave people so that the guilt of their sins no longer weighed them down. Only the divine Son of God can work miracles like that. Only the divine Son of God can not only physically heal, but spiritually heal. You see, Jesus came to a young woman, the daughter of Jairus, and he said, Tabitha, arise, arise, come forth. And she came out of the slumbering sleep of death to be resurrected by Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can forgive our sins. Only Jesus can truly heal not only the physical body, but the spiritual. And there's a powerful Christ that transforms in genuine healing. Yes, some evil spirits may attempt to counterfeit healing. Beware, my friends, as we consider this here in PICC, beware of the tricks of the devil. Only genuine healing comes from Jesus Christ. Don't be fooled. Jesus raised people from the dead. He is the life giver. He healed. He forgave. He raised the dead. Now most of the prophecies of his life were fulfilled at his last moments. Prophecies that fit together like pieces in a puzzle. 
prophecies that reveal actually who he is. So why was John on the island of Patmos in the book of Revelation? Why didn't he give up his faith? Why wouldn't he yield to compromise? Because he believed that Christ could raise him from the dead. He believed that Christ was his companion in his tribulation on the island of Patmos. He believed that Jesus was alive. Because John had studied the Old Testament, John saw the prophecies fulfilled at the very end of Christ's life. Prophecies fulfilled at the end of our Lord's wonderful sojourn here on this earth. The, mag the most magnificent prophecies were fulfilled right at the very end. So come now to the city of Jerusalem. Jesus gathered his disciples around him at that last supper. He looked at his disciples and a prophecy was made a thousand years before by David to be fulfilled that very night. Psalm chapter 41 verse 9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. How did David know 1,000 years before in advance that a very close friend of Jesus would betray him? Because this book, the Bible, is not a common book. It is divinely inspired, and Christ is not a common man. You see, some very precise, detailed prophecies reveal to us that Christ is divine. Now, notice very carefully the accuracy and precision of these prophecies that reveal Christ's trial and his betrayal. Zechariah, in the Old Testament, one of the Minor Prophets, as we call it, the latter part of the Old Testament, chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Now I want you to notice this. It doesn't say 25 pieces of silver. It doesn't say 35 pieces of silver. It says 30 pieces of silver. How did the Bible know that in the days of Christ, 500 years after Zechariah, that the price of a slave would be 30 pieces of silver? 500 years ago, was a loaf of bread the same price as it is today? No. Was food the same price 500 years ago as it is today? No. Was gasoline the same price even 30 years ago as today? How did the Bible know that Christ would be sold for 30 pieces of silver? How did they know that even in the very currency of the days of Jesus it would be silver? Christ is no common man. And the Bible is no common book. You see, everything around you may crumble and fall. You may have difficulty in your relationships, in your work, whatever it is. But I want to tell you, God's word will stand forever. And Christ has the keys of death. He can unlock the grave. You can place your confidence in him. Bible prophecy confirms that Jesus is divine. In the same book of Zechariah, chapter 11 and verse 13, So I took the thirty pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Now this is fascinating. Prophecy is absolutely precise. Number one, the amount. 30 pieces of silver. Number two, the result. 
Judas's conscience hurt him so badly as a condemned man, he refused to keep that money and he returned to the temple where the priests were who gave him the money. He threw it on the floor. You see, everybody that sells out Christ finds the thing they betrayed him for was simply too heavy to hold. The Bible says in the book of Acts that Judas went out and hung himself. The rope broke and he fell down, smashing his body among the rocks. What a price to pay for betraying Jesus. Don't betray Jesus yourself. Allow Christ to work in you and be awake and alive in his power. The Bible says 30 pieces of silver, exactly. The Bible says the money would be taken, thrown on the floor of the temple. Selling out Christ cheap is not worth it. And so the Bible says also that the money would be used to buy a potter's field by the priests who didn't want to keep that money because it was blood money. They didn't want to keep it in their bags of money. And so they went out and bought a potter's field. So the Bible tells us three exact things about it. The amount, 30 pieces of silver. The result, throwing it on the floor of the temple. The place, the purchasing of a potter's field. Now if you go to the New Testament, you'll find that this prophecy was fulfilled exactly. Judas came to the temple. He threw the money on the floor. The priest didn't know what to do with it. And in Matthew 27, verse 5, it says, Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. And they consulted together, that's the priests, and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. So the prophecy was fulfilled minutely down to the very point of explanation. You see, Christ is more than a good man or an ethical teacher or a high-flying philosopher. He is divine. He is the Son of God. The prophecies of the last 24 hours of his life came to one focal point. They focused upon his death, magnifying his death on a hill called Golgotha a place called Calvary. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. Now here is a prediction given by Isaiah over 600 years in advance before Christ came. And it says the Messiah would be beaten. It says that he would give his cheeks for them to pull out his beard. It also says, I did not hide my face from shame and spit it. How could the Bible predict 600 years in advance what would take place in Pilate's courtyard? How could it predict 600 years in advance that they would take Jesus and beat his back by whipping him? Watch as the crown of thorns is jammed on his head. Watch as they put that robe over his head and spin him around and slap him on the face. Watch as they mock him, as they spit upon him, as they curse him. Listen to the snap of that Roman whip, leather embedded with metal and bone, ripping his back to shreds. Watch as he was bound to that column. Listen to the cries of agony and see those tears in his eyes. Who is this that suffers so much? Who is this that is mocked by Pilate's soldiers? Who is it that is sent from Herod to Pilate? Who is it that was treated like a common criminal? Who is it that suffers with nails 
in his hands. Who is it that suffers with the crown of thorns on his head? It is Jesus, the divine Son of God. Not merely a good man or an incredible philosopher, he is the divine Son of God. When you pick up this Bible and you read the prophecies and understand what Jesus did for you and for me, you can understand that the blood of the Son of God provided our key, our key of escape, our wonderful opportunity for finding eternal life in Jesus. You will read in the scripture about Christ who is eternal. He is divine. He holds the keys to the grave. He is the Christ, the divine one. Psalm chapter 22, verse 16. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now you might say, wait a minute. When a woman in the Bible was caught in adultery and it was cast down at the feet of Jesus, what did the Jews want to do to her? Well, they wanted to do to her what everybody did. They wanted to stone her. Stoning was the method of capital punishment for centuries. Crucifixion was only introduced about 150 years before Christ. It was practiced until the year of Constantine, about 320 A.D. So it was a period of about 500 years that crucifixion was used. Now here's the question. How did David, who wrote a thousand years before Jesus Christ, know that Christ's hands would be pierced? How did he know? Because he was divinely inspired by heaven. Why did he write it down in the Bible? He wrote it for one reason, to give you and me right here in the PICC tonight confidence that the Christ who died on Calvary was more than just a good person. He was the divine Son of God. And we can kneel at the foot of the cross we can confess our sins and our sins will be forgiven right there at the cross. Our shame will be rolled away and that cross can give us a wonderful open door for eternal life. You and I can become a new man, a new woman in Jesus Christ. There was a thief that was dying alongside Jesus and this thief as he was dying, looked over at Jesus and began to mock him, saying, If you are the Son of God, come down off the cross and get us off the cross too. But then there was another thief on the other side. The second thief looked at Jesus and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. There has never been a man, there's never been a woman who has uttered that cry, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom that has been turned away from the Lord. And Christ said, I say unto you today, this day that I'm dying on the cross, this day when blood is running down my face, this day when I have been stripped naked on the cross. And let me just add... The death on the cross was one of the most humiliating deaths anyone could endure. Jesus died, we're told, in Philippians chapter 2, the death of the cross. And when you died on a cross, a cross was an inhumane form of torture. It was physically painful but it was also psychologically demeaning. People could come up to the person and normally the person was not put on a cross way up on a mountaintop somewhere and people would see it a long ways away. It was put right next to where people could walk and they could come up to that person, the person dying in pain, and they would curse at them and they would spit in their face 
and they could do nothing. But the worst humiliation was that you died naked. What a humble example by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as he was on that cross and that thief was appealing to him, Jesus said, on this day, when I am nailed to the cross, I can tell you today, I can tell you right now, that when I do come, because that's what he was referring to in the future, you will be with me in paradise. Many have come to the foot of the cross and have found the peace and the forgiveness and the mercy that only Jesus can give. The Roman centurion came, a hard, cold-hearted Roman centurion who had said that morning, well, just another man to put up on a cross, just another criminal to get rid of. Hey, people, get out of my way. I've got a job to do. Move that cart. Move that oxen. I've got a person to kill today. I've got business to do. We have Roman orders to follow, crucify this man. Christ and these other criminals, that hard-hearted Roman soldier, jaded by the sight of death in war, a Roman centurion at that cross, looked up into the eyes of Jesus, and he saw more than just a good man, more than a powerful philosopher, he saw that he was the divine Son of God. And it broke the heart of the centurion. He left that cross never to be the same again. And tonight, you can leave this place never to be the same again. You know, most biographies end with a man's death, but not Christ's. John 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. You see, Jesus spoke to John on the island of Patmos, and he said, John, I am the resurrected Lord, right of my glory, right of my power. And when you're writing that book, you will encourage men and women all the way down through history, even to the auditorium of the PICC. I am the divine Christ. Because Christ was resurrected from the dead, he is alive tonight. And this Christ, through the power of his spirit, can change your life. Because Christ is alive, he can transform your life through his spirit. Revelation 2 and 3 begins to describe the church in every age. It's a message from Christ. The first church is Ephesus. Ephesus means desirable, a church that was vibrant for its faith, a church that lived in the first century, but a church that left its first love. The resurrected Christ says to John, write it down. So in Revelation 2 verse 7, it says, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. If you've known Christ before, but you've lost your first love, the Lord says, come to me. I am the Christ who is alive. Then the second church, Smyrna. Jesus says to John, write it down. Smyrna means sweet-smelling incense. It was a church that was persecuted, a church where Christians were fed to lions and burned at the stake, all because they loved Jesus. You see, Smyrna's faithfulness to Christ was like sweet-smelling incense. And in the 11th verse of that chapter, it says, He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So in the face of martyrdom and persecution, you can overcome through the living Christ. And then what happened to the third church of Thyatira? It corrupts its faith. False doctrine comes in. But what does Jesus say? What does the divine Christ says in verse 26? And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And so you see, this Christ who is speaking is the divine Christ. 
the one who was resurrected from the dead. You don't need to hold on to false doctrines. You don't need to compromise. You need to hold on to the living Christ. The Lord will give you the power to understand fully his word. You can overcome through the blood and the power of Christ. You do not need to let the world squeeze you into its mold. You can hang on to the Lord and say, Lord, help me to walk securely through all the falsehoods and the errors that are around me. Help me to stay close to the word of God. Sardis, a dead church. When you read about Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, you see that the spiritual life in the church has been strangled. In verse 5 it says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So you see that there's a spiritual death all around. And Jesus says, you can have life. I'll confess, you can confess my name before the angels. Then the sixth church, Philadelphia. The twelfth verse of Revelation 3 says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. You see, Philadelphia, that church, was a church that faced trial and difficulty, trials that they didn't expect Trials that it didn't imagine and it overwhelmed them. Trials that brought great discouragement. But Christ is in the business of changing lives. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Now what are the riches of his glory? It is his divinity. The fact that through his divine glory he was resurrected from the dead. And it goes on to say to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. You see, because Christ was resurrected from the dead, he can give you his glory. Jesus can give you his power. You may have been falling into sin and into temptation. You may be practicing habits that you wish you could overcome. You may be chained to attitudes and difficulties. And if only I had a different attitude. If only I could free myself from these prisons of temptation. Christ is alive and promises to come through the power of the Holy Spirit to resurrect you in power and in glory. You see, the Christ that was resurrected from the dead is still resurrecting men and women today from spiritual death into spiritual life. Romans chapter 8 verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so Jesus said to John on the island of Patmos, Tell the church in every age to every church that no matter what it faces, it can overcome through the blood and the power of Jesus Christ. John, write it down, write it down, that whatever God's people face, they can overcome through my power. Your heart may be stirred tonight. Your heart may be moving in God's direction. The Lord can solve every spiritual problem that you face. Jesus says, this is the divine Christ. This is the Christ that walks among us. A few years ago, an evangelist was preaching to a very large crowd similar to this in the city of Moscow. A simple, simple humble Russian woman came up to him and said, Pastor, I'd like to invite you to come to my home and to eat. And so the evangelist went there into a small little apartment, three rooms and one narrow little kitchen, one small bedroom where three to four people would sleep, a living room that served as a dining room as well. 
Nancy and I have lived in Moscow and we know some of those apartments. And the evangelist entered and at first everyone just made some kind of small talk. An American, this evangelist was from America, an American had never been in that home before. It was a little bit tense. The evangelist looked at the table and he knew that that dear lady had spent one month's salary simply to bring him fresh food, nuts, a variety of vegetables, breads, and many other things. And as they sat down to eat, she kept asking questions about America. And after a while, the evangelist thought, well, I should ask her something. And so he said, my dear sister, what was the most difficult thing that you experienced under communism? What was the most heart-rending experience that you had? Well, that night, the evangelist heard a tragic story. The lady began to cry. Her translator reached over to the arm of the evangelist and said, pull back, don't, don't ask her anymore, but go in a different direction, ask another question. But this woman continued. It was too late. The words just came tumbling out of her heart. She said, Pastor, I brought up my children to know Jesus. I read the Bible to them every day. We'd have worship in the morning and worship at night. But pastor, that was against the law. You could not teach your children about Jesus. I want to say tonight, each of us ought to thank God for the government of the Philippines that provides you with religious liberty to read the Bible every night. Thank God for that opportunity. But she said, I couldn't legally read the Bible, but I read it one night very late. A knock was at the door. About one o'clock in the morning, a KGB officer came to my apartment. They banged on the door and finally I opened it up. They slapped me in the face. They kicked me. They knocked me down. And then, Pastor, they took my nine-year-old daughter. They walked out with her. They said, if you do not refrain from teaching your children about Christ, we will come back and get your other daughter. And pastor, I haven't seen that daughter for 27 years. She was only nine years old, pastor. The evangelist was overwhelmed. Well, why did you keep reading the Bible to your other daughter? She said, because I believe in the living Christ. I've given my life to him, the living divine Christ. You see, he is raised from the dead, and one day he will reunite me with my daughter again. This risen Jesus has entered the door of my heart and given me courage. And this Christ, my dear friend, here in the PICC, knocks on the doors of your hearts tonight. That Christ can still solve problems. He is still alive today and will be throughout eternity. He is divine. Jesus is in the business of changing lives. He is a miracle worker and he reaches into the hearts of you and me today. He forgives sin. He brings us to the foot of the cross. The Lord is knocking on your heart right now you let him in? Will you allow the divine Christ to take complete control of your life? I'd like you to consider Jesus, the divine Son of God. And I'd like you to respond in a very profound way. Right now, our ushers are going to pass to each of you a very special card. I want everyone to obtain one of these little cards. And this card will say on it, I'm going to ask our ushers to come up and to pass out the cards to everybody. 
if the ushers would come and pass those cards to everybody, everyone will receive a card and it says on here, I believe Jesus is the divine Son of God. If you have been convinced tonight through the power of God that He truly is the Son of God, check that. The second one, I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. The third one, I have drifted away, but tonight recommit my life to Jesus. The fourth one, I would like more reading material to grow in Jesus and a knowledge of Him. I'd like for our ushers to pass these cards out to everyone in the audience. Everyone should receive a card. And at the end of our beautiful song, we will pass those cards back in. Listen now to an appeal to your very heart through the power of beautiful music. Please lead us to the throne of grace. Oh! 
source of strength, my source of hope, is Christ alone, the power of the cross. Tonight, I hope you have taken time to fill that card out, to check the appropriate boxes, to write your name in commitment to the Lord. And now, for those who have written, if you would pass those cards in, either to the middle or to the end, where our ushers will collect those. And if by chance you haven't had time, you can certainly fill it out and give it to someone at the registration table when you leave. Christ, the divine Son of God. I ask now that you will bow your heads with me in prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you that long before even the establishment of this earth, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit came together to create a plan of salvation. And that centuries before it ever happened, it was predicted because you inspired people to write about the Christ, Jesus, our Savior. And Jesus came at the right time, in the right way, and lived a life of perfection, fighting against temptation through the power of the Lord and His Heavenly Father, living a perfect life and dying for us being raised to life again, and now interceding for us in the most holy place, the divine Christ, the one who can change our lives. Thank you for all you have done. Be with us now as we return to our homes and our places of sleeping, and we ask that you will bring us back here tomorrow night to learn more about the revelation of hope. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You will not want to miss tomorrow night. Tomorrow night will thrill your heart as we talk about the greatest event yet to come. Jesus' second coming.